Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Adam Lipton. Adam, how are we doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited because we're going to talk about something unique. But first, let's before we get into your, your uh, current endeavor, let's actually get involved. Who is Adam? Can I get a little background? Sure. So um, my name is Adam Lippin, uh, and I'm currently living in Louisiana. We came here early in COVID to ride out COVID for a few weeks from New York and wound up staying here. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have had, uh, this is my third real business. I've had a bunch of businesses that have sort of like lasted a short period of time, but uh, I've had different businesses in different verticals. And uh, I love my family. I love to bike ride and hike and practice yoga and uh, read. And um, yeah, I'm generally a pretty good guy. <laughs> nice. So, so New York to Louisiana. Yeah. So my husband is from South Louisiana and we live on the LSU, Louisiana State University lakes. And he always wanted to have a house on the LSU lake. So he got one about eight years ago that we were using as a vacation home. You know, we have relatives here and uh, we're now living here. I love it. And you, you mentioned um, LSU as well, university. You have somebody yeah. going there to LSU university as well. My son, our son's going to LSU that starting. Awesome. The, the old, the tigers. Man, yeah. I, got, I got to get over there and watch a football game. That's what I yeah, want. It's, it's been a pretty interesting couple of years. In fact, the new coach moved three houses down from us. Oh, we're, <laughs> maybe I can get some tickets in. <laughs> maybe. But before we get into that, let's talk about Atomic Wings. What is it? Tell, tell the world uh, what we're doing. So I founded Atomic Wings about a year or two after I graduated college. I went to school in upstate New York in Binghamton. And I fell in love with wings, which were invented in Buffalo. And I actually trained up at Duff's and the Anchor Bar, the places that are credited um, for starting it. And anyway, I just fell in love with wings and I'd buy myself a bucket of wings and I would go into my dorm room and I'd lock the door because people would smell it and, and I didn't <laughs> want to share. And I would literally eat 50 wings by myself. And I just was a wing <laughs> fanatic. And I moved back to, I moved to New York City upon graduation. And uh, you couldn't get great chicken wings. So I lived on uh, I lived on 32nd and 2nd Avenue for any of you who know Manhattan. And it wasn't like a neighbor that people really went to at the time if you lived there. Uh, but there was a pizza place that had chicken wings. And it was always really um, a lot of people were there and, and eating wings. And so I started to ask people like, oh, you know, you look familiar. Where are you from? And people were coming in from Jersey, from all over the city for these wings. So I thought... I could really kill it by bringing authentic buffalo wings into New York City, uh, doing the traditional way. So I started with a kitchen and a bar on the Upper East Side. I wound up growing it to 32 locations, which I franchised and I had a very successful wholesale business. And I sold all of it about five years ago. Wow. So let's let's take a step back. How did you go from, you know, just starting uh, there doing it, you said from the bar and then to you know, 36 locations, franchise locations. How did, how did you just grass root it the whole way? Did you get some venture capital? How'd you start that? So I never got venture capital uh, for this. My current company is a VC backed company. Um, I mean, spit and glue. I mean, I started it. I was looking for a location. I went into a bar to go to the bathroom and I saw this kitchen that wasn't really being used. I approached the owner. I said, you know, let me take over your kitchen. I'll, you know, figure out a rent. And I'll help bring people to your bar, you sell more drinks. And it turned out to be, so we, we made an agreement. And at the time he had, he was giving out free wings for like happy hour. And, you know, uh, he's like, I can't, I can't, you know, these people come for the wings. I said, yes, they're eating your food and they're drinking one beer and you're losing money in them. Let me bring in people that you can make money from. So uh, that, that's how it started. And I literally went down to the Bowery, which at the time was the place in New York where you got used restaurant equipment. Uh, and I just figured it out and I went step by step by step and I would go to Buffalo a lot. I befriended the owners of, of the anchor bar, which is where Buffalo wings were created. And this place called Duff's, uh, which is basically where the university kids hung out and I got their recipes. I used the same suppliers and I brought it to New York and I called the, uh, mayor of the city of Buffalo. And I said, Buffalo has a really bad reputation. 
And I said, I'm going to promote the hell out of Buffalo in New York. I'm opening one restaurant. He invited me to Buffalo. He gave me the key to the city. Pictures that were taken was in the front page of the local paper in Buffalo. And before we even had a sign up, right, it, it gave the location. And I'd see people walking up and down the, the street with like a newspaper that family members that lived in Buffalo sent to their kids that now live in the city. And that's how we started. So um, it took off from there. So how did it continue to grow from just, you know, you mentioned the bar scenes to the franchise? Yeah. So I kept, so this was on the Upper East Side. This success, this location became successful. I start, I found a location in the village, East Village, the West Village, the Upper West Side. It was a very inexpensive way to start a business because the infrastructure was in place. Uh, so it was an untapped business and delivery is very big in New York City. And uh, that's how I started. And I ran, I did that for uh, maybe six or seven years. And then I opened my first freestanding location. And then I opened some more freestanding locations. And then I think when I was about 12 or 13 locations, uh, I decided to franchise. So I went through all the regulatory processes to be able to franchise. And then that became another business because I was selling franchises as opposed to running individual stores. Very different business model. But I think it was important to really have an understanding of how to open and own and run restaurants in order to be able to sell them. And one thing that I think I did, which was really smart, was we uh, private labeled our sauce. I started out using Frank's Red Hot and you know barbecue sauce, off, you know things that you can get from a distributor. And I was like, wait a second. So I took pro these pro taste these uh, uh, the profiles of the the hot sauce and all these different sauces. And I went to a private label manufacturer. And uh, we started private labeling sauces. And ultimately, I distributed those sauces uh, wholesale as well. So now, th this is a lot of great stuff. Because uh, one, you talked about the difference between financing and owning the business. I would love to, I'd love to kind of dive into that a little bit, because it is a little bit of different business strategy. So can you give folks at home, because I'm, I'm, I've never sold franchise. So what what kind of things are you thinking of when you're going in versus owning a, a restaurant to yes. selling a franchise? What do you so what do you, you own restaurants? Uh, you run the restaurant. You're in charge of sort of everything to do with it. And then if you're successful, what you realize and you have a few locations that you have developed a system of operating, right? You have recipes in place. You have some rough manuals in place. You know how to do inventory. You have an ordering process in place. And so what you've really, what I created really was a, was a, you know, franchise essentially a business in a box, right? So you, you give someone and you train them the, the, how to run a restaurant, the systems and the procedures. Here's your signage. Here's your kitchen equipment specs. Here's how large your counter is. Here's your lighting plan, et cetera, et cetera. So you, allow someone to do what you've done successfully for themselves. And in return, they pay you a royalty, a percentage of the income that they receive. Um, and uh, it helps grow your brand. One of the most things that I'm most proud of is that I, as a restaurant owner, I employed a lot of people uh, and I was part of the economy. And as a franchisor, I was allowing people who had a dream to open their own business to have that support their families um, and grow and grow themselves financially in that way. So it was very gratifying. You know, you mentioned uh, when when you're doing the franchise, you have to kind of get down to the granular uh, measurements, right? Of like, hey, this is where it's going to be placed, and this is how you're cooking it for this long and this temperature. What are some of the regulations that you had to go through? when going through the process of becoming a regular, uh, becoming a franchise owner? Franchise in the, in the U S is probably the most highly regulated business. Oh, really? Um, you have to, uh, be, you have to be audited and you put together what's called uniform friend. It's a uniform franchise, UFOC, unified franchise offering circular that details to the specification exactly what you're offering. Uh, because if you say something and it's not true, you've committed a crime. Right. So you need to be really careful that your offering represents truth. So if you're saying this is the recipe and this is the food cost and this is sort of the, you know, you, everything that you say, you're, you're, you, it has to be accurate. Right. So you have to be really careful and have all your ducks in order, uh, rightly so, because someone is investing, they're building out a store, they're paying you 
money uh, that you better make sure you give them uh, the highest likelihood to success. And in order to have a replicatable business, everyone needs to replicate it the same way or it gets bastardized. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure I, you know, I'm sure the, a franchisee's grandmother made the best garlic Parmesan sauce in the whole entire world and everyone should eat it, but that can't replace your garlic Parmesan, yeah. that's your menu spec, because people, when they go to, you know, different restaurants at the chain, they expect the same thing. So there's a, so there's a compliance aspect to it. Uh, there's making sure you're very clear in your guidelines. Training is incredibly important. Uh, you know, you become someone that checks a business versus running a business. It's almost like quality control. It is quality control. It's total quality control. And it's marketing, you know, helping marketing support, supporting the overall brand. So you go from trying to make, the, you know, one best store and you're, you know, you have literally a legal fiduciary responsibility to do your best to make sure that you're supporting your franchisees. Now, I imagine, you know, being a restaurant owner and then, you know, pivoting into the franchise, they are both have some difficulties in them. What, what are some of the difficulties that you realize going through this process? They're like, oh, didn't know that was going to be an issue. Either one from the restaurant side and then also from the franchise side. From the restaurant side, uh, be prepared to work tremendously long hours. Be prepared for everything that can go wrong to go wrong. You will <laughs> be prepared to be in the middle of a shift. Your, you know, your fan belt on your exhaust system will break something will happen the electric will go off there'll be a you know a leak in the ceiling the fire department will show up for a random inspection uh, it is a really difficult business and um, if you are an individual owner you have to really mind your store uh, so just be prepared to work really hard you don't need to be incredibly smart to own a restaurant but you need to really uh, have your eyes open and be prepared to work hard as you're able to grow and you can hire managers that are good and competent, then your role shifts a bit. But if you have one or two restaurants, you need to make sure you're working a lot of hours and you really have an understanding of where your money is going. You should know the names of your customers. You should, you know, have that kind of rapport. You need to build a loyal audience base and you need to deliver a really good product really consistently all the time. Now, when, when did you decide, when was it like the kind of aha moment for you to say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and, and sell because you mentioned you, you now you sold the, the rights of the franchise. Yeah. And so now it's, when did you decide that? So I ran my company, I ran stores for uh, 10 or 12 years, whatever it was. And then I franchised for the rest. I had my business for a total of 25 years. And it's fantastic. I supported my family. I made a, a nice living. I had a lot of outside interests and it was really wonderful. What happened for me personally is it no longer fed my soul. I mean, we were, I was at a store opening uh, that was being opened in uh, uh, Maryland, right? And part of the franchisor is you are the cheerleader. You are the advocate. You're there to really make sure that you know, what you're doing is the most important, most special thing in the world. But it really was no longer true for me. Like, I didn't really personally care if there was another Atomic Wings somewhere. Yeah. It's wonderful. The people that bought it are blowing it up and it's great. But for me, I lost my personal passion. It's really hard to do something that you're not personally, personally passionate about. When I founded the company, I really cared about the, the size of the carrots and like everything was really meaningful and really important for me. And as I grew, my interest started to shift and it wasn't, I wasn't passionate. So when I became not passionate about it, I knew I couldn't be my best. And I was therefore doing a, a disservice to all of the other people involved. And then the, that's when I realized I had to sell. Now, was this your first business that you started? It was, I started this business uh, when I was 25. I graduated college. I was, I ran the a, uh, Mayor Oriole campaign in upstate New York. Um, I moved to the city and I was a commercial real estate broker. I started another business between being a commercial real estate broker. Uh, I had, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember phone lines, 
uh, <laughs> I had uh, different, non they were called non under numbers at the time. And you basically called the number and you got information. So I had a uh, line, the Wall Street hotline. I partnered with financial uh, companies to get the latest in stock bond and financial news. And I partnered with media companies to provide the advertising. And I did the same thing uh, for what's called La Linea de Disporti y Lateria, the line of sports and lotto in Spanish. And then they had like a party line, like a like meet people connection. So I started that and that did incredibly well. Uh, and then while I was doing that, I had this dream since college uh, not that many years ago to like bring authentic Buffalo wings to New York. So that's when I, I started doing that. Awesome. So look, I'm, I'm going to, I got to ask about this one 900 thing now. How, how did you one brilliant freaking brilliant. <laughs> how did you think of this idea? And then how so I was living in New York at the time and I was visiting Los Angeles and there was a billboard and it was for a phone sex line, a 900 number. You know, <laughs> you love the West Coast, Coast, and I'm like, this is fucking brilliant. <laughs> Excuse my language. So I get back to New York. I called the phone company. I said, Hey, I was in California. I saw this 900 number. Can I get one in New York? They said, well, and I think this was like October. And they said, you know, it's towards the end of the regulatory process give us your name. And if it passes, we'll let you know. So I got a call a month and a half later and they said it just passed. I was the first person in New York to have a 900 number. Wow. Uh, so that's how it started. Wow. Man. So how did you monetize that? So, well, the, the services were 99 cents for the first minute and 45 cents for each additional minute. Oh, wow. Right? And so I worked my ass off. So for the party line, I would, um, Literally, I, I worked selling commercial real estate, and my my territory was New York, Boston to Buffalo. And I'd get in my car at night, and I would pick different bars, and I would put little flyers on the cars, and get kicked out of parking lots, and you know the whole thing. <laughs> and I did that, and I advertised on local cable TV before cable TV was like when it was still like a community little challenge, you know, channel thing. And then when I started the Wall Street hotline, I reached out to a friend of mine that worked in Wall Street and said, I want to do this. You know, how do I get this information? He said, well, we, you know, let, let us partner with you and we'll give you a seat, like a, a physical chair, right, on, the, on the, the trading floor and the stock ticker goes around and it gives you the latest stock bond and financial list. And so I basically hired, you know, a kid to sit there and we gave him a script and said, today's financial news on today's financial news, you can just read the ticker. The stock bond is at this number. And this was pre when everyone had Bloomberg yeah. terminal, right? Yeah. And so we were able to give real time information which people that traded really cared about it before they had access to it. And so that's how I did that one. And then advertising in New York City is very expensive. So I went to some media people, Crane's business, Crane's New York business. Uh, and said, hey, why don't you partner with me? You do the media, I'm doing the content. And that's how that happened. So, so let's, let's, let's catch up here. We were at the 1900. We went ahead and did Atomic Wings. We now sold the franchise. So yeah, so first I did, right, I went from college, new marketing company, commercial real estate, the phone lines, Atomic Wings. Now you have a new company. You say it's venture back by. So, yeah. So, uh, talk there, about that so one. when I, I turned 50, I just sold Atomic Wings. And my whole non working life, other than being a parent, was yoga and meditation. And I was on this spiritual quest. I was really, so I started teaching yoga, leading meditation retreats. You know, I went to India a bunch of times. And my life, my avocation was about sort of a spiritual sense of development, et cetera. Who am I? All that stuff. And, um, Loneliness was, I, don't, I, had, I had been really lonely as a child and for various reasons. And loneliness was a, a really uh, important part of, it basically led me to drugs and alcohol and led me to meditation, all in ways to find a way out. And I realized for myself that I couldn't drink my way out of feeling, right? It just, it, it hid me even further from other people. Yeah, yeah. And I could meditate and do it really well and really get a sense of peace but it, I, it could also disconnect me from people. So I knew that really the only way I'm gonna have a true happy life is to be in connection with other people. And for me, that was a really big challenge. I was gay, I knew it when I was young, it disconnected me from other people. 
all these different factors. And so loneliness was a big deal. And um, so I turned 50, I sold Atomic Wings. I wanted to bring my avocation to life. So really wanted to deal with the loneliness crisis. Uh, under uh, President Obama, uh, the Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who's the current Surgeon General, said that loneliness is the number one health crisis facing our country, worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, worse than obesity. And that resonated with me in my personal experience. So it's like, what can I do in this space? And I started a professional cuddling business called Cuddlist, and it's still around and I still own it, C-U-D-D-L-I-S-T.com. And we train and certify people to be professional cuddlers. And then people that want to have that service can, uh, you know, go online, find someone in book sessions. And everyone laughed at me, right? So I have like, I'm a, from this New York Jewish family. So when I told my great, my Frida, my Aunt Frida, like I'm selling chicken wings, <laughs> like become a doctor. What are you talking about, right? <laughs> then when I said I'm selling this to sell, to become a, you know, sell cuddles, you know, you can imagine, right? The, 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 the comments that I got. Oh, and man. people told me I'm not going to be able to sell a business just having chicken wings because it wasn't a thing at the time. And I was like, watch me. And the same thing with Cuddles. I, I have this ability, or sometimes if I, if I visualize something, I can sort of make it happen. Right. So I know I need to know where the end is. So that helps me figure out where to start to get to the end. So I have the end goal in mind. Right. So I started that business and it became very, very successful we helped a tremendous amount of people. So think about people who are physically disabled on the autism spectrum, you know, uh, they've lost a loved one. It's very profound. And I can get into that if you want, but we've I've really got a sense of just how lonely people are and how much people really need to feel a sense of connection. We did some studies on our users. People are lonely. They're really disconnected. They want to feel seen, heard, and validated and have a human connection. Many of us don't have that human connection. So I have this business. People started to call in and you know, reach out to us and say, I don't have $100. I'm not near one of your practitioners. Can I just talk to someone? So I knew going into Cuddlist that this wasn't going to be like the great scalable business, right? Then the light bulb went off. It's like connecting people solving loneliness through mobile technology, right? Uh, can, it can happen. So we have the technology, apps exist at this point, right? There are tons of people that want to be heard and there's tons of people, if given some training, can be there for other people. So I mentioned earlier that I'm gay. I grew up feeling really disconnected. I wanted other gay people to talk to. I didn't have that. I knew I didn't need therapy. There was nothing wrong with me in that regard. I just felt lonely and disconnected. So I felt like if I could connect people, other people with a similar lived experience with some basic training, then uh, that can go a long way towards solving loneliness and ultimately addressing a mental health crisis. Because as I said earlier, loneliness is the number one uh, crisis that, that leads to a lot of mental health and physical health negative outcomes, right? And I also knew that I had an experience that could be very beneficial for someone who's going through something similar. And I knew that like if I had been, you know, and so we, I started this company here with the concept of connecting people based on shared lived experiences. So we have different filters that people can choose from LGBTQIA, uh, uh, relationships, university, disordered eating, body image, COVID-19, et cetera. So people are able to find working moms, people are able to find the people that they can relate to, they instantly feel comfortable and they have, and they just communicate with each other. You know, you said something extremely important that I really wanna make sure our listeners are definitely hearing this. Uh, one thing you mentioned, you know, you, you said you are gay and then you also said, there's nothing wrong with you. And that is so true. And so for those folks listening at home, that are struggling either with obesity or being coming out of the closet or any of these things that people are constantly telling you that you should not be. I'm, I'm here and I'm here with my boy, Adam, right now. We're telling you, you're okay. There's nothing wrong with you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. You are beautiful in your own skin. Please don't let anybody else tell you that you are anything different than perfect because it is your imperfections that make you perfect to somebody else. So please, that for those folks that are listening, Adam, thank you so much for bringing that up because it is really important for people to understand that there is nothing wrong with you. And, and in fact, there's something wrong with our society 
that keeps telling us that there's something wrong with him because it is it is the beauty of all of our all of our makeups that make this world. I keep talking about constantly. We are a global community of entrepreneurs, right? It's not just the United States, not just Oregon. It's, it's a global community, and so you know, having having that wherewithal is so important. Now, the cuddling the cuddling thing. I must. I want to just comment on that real yeah. quick because I think that's really important. So, from a personal perspective, absolutely, we're you know, there's something wrong with society that tells us that there's something wrong with us. But inherently, we're all depending on your religious or spiritual background, we're all children, we're all, we're all equal, we're all right, and we all, we all are very different. Um, but that being said, if you're thinking of starting a business, right, you, to have a business, you're going to work really hard, and you need to really, to have a business and not be authentic, and to, mm, yeah. so if you, so basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, having a business, what, what people knew when I was selling chicken wings, right, is that I was really passionate about this product. This product is not a life-saving, changing product. But I, they knew I'm out there trying to make the best chicken wing, the most authentic Buffalo experience, and I'm serving it with love. And I know that sounds crazy, but I meant it, and it really, and I think it, it, it manifested, right? So having a purpose and being authentic to that purpose is more important than having a great idea that you're not 100% behind because you will have like a marriage or anything, right? You're going to not always be in love with it. But if you don't have that initial passion, that's going to drive you through the hard times. It's going to make it more difficult. So obviously you want to make money, but if you go into the business with that as the goalpost, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Like I wanted to solve the problem that you couldn't get great chicken wings in New York, right? right. So it, it's, it's so just the way that you hold it. It's very true. You know, I think we've, we've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs on this episode, on this uh, podcast and it's, it's ringing true. Uh, and I hope the listeners are really starting to take, uh, take note of this is it's the passion that drives your, your business. A lot of times, you know, if you're passionate about something it no longer becomes a job, right. No longer, it actually becomes something you're just passionate about you're doing. And so I, I really do commend you now. Now you mentioned you, you pivoted into the cuddling, mm -hmm. right? But now you're you're pivoting again to a new company. Hear me. So I wanted to do something that addresses loneliness at scale. Cuddlist addresses loneliness on a nice level, but it doesn't address loneliness at scale. So I wanted to do that. And technology exists. When I started my first phone line business, it was essentially a fancy, you know, Remember answering machines, right? Where like people got connected that way. <laughs> technology changes, right? So the technology exists to connect people in massive ways. Social media, the problem is it can do, it can connect them in healthy way, healthy ways or unhealthy ways, right? So yep. how do we connect people in a way that's going to make them feel better? And we're going to do it by creating uh, a situation where there's no stigma, there's no judgment. The, the concept of being there is for support. There's no fear of missing out and you're able to bring your entire self. You're not sort of creating a, a, a narrative. So I'm on LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile, I had someone help me craft it. So it's like 3X founder, emotional wellness, whatever. It's curated for a particular persona. And people do that with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the other ones, uh, TikTok. So, I wanted to create the anti-social media. I wanted to use technology to help solve some of the problems that technology created. So that was that and, and just being able to support people at scale using people. So there's a statistic that came out a couple of years ago, pre-COVID from the US government that said in order to solve the existing mental health crisis, you would need four and a half million new therapists, right? A, that will never happen. B you still don't solve for access, affordability, and immediacy. And in Los Angeles right now, only 2% of therapists, licensed therapists, are non-white. So you're certainly not solving for addressing, meeting people where they are with the identity that they relate to. So finding care, even if you can afford it, is really difficult. Imagine if you can't afford it, you don't have insurance, and you want to talk to someone that you feel like you can relate to from a cultural perspective. So that's a huge problem to solve. 
And based on my personal experience, therapy wasn't the answer, right? Human connection was the answer. So I wanted to do that. You know, you've, you've throughout this conversation, you've said connection and connecting and connect, right? Connecting folks together. How important is networking to you? So networking in the business sense is important. Networking, I mean, networking in the sense that all of us should be able to get something off their chest and feel less lonely because all of us deserve that. And interestingly, how do you really feel better, right? I love getting a massage like the next person. You know, self-care is a big buzzword. But if you really want to feel better, help someone. Be there for someone else. If you really want to, you know, have a spiritual experience or impact, you know, you can't do it by just doing, getting massages or whatever. You really need to, uh, you know, in AA, it says, if you want to feel self-esteem, do an esteemable act, right? I like so that. being able to use your experience to be there for somewhere else, be there for someone else is incredibly powerful. So that's really important to me. Nice. Now, so you've, you've, Sarah entrepreneur, I mean, you, you went from the 900, you were doing commercial real estate, atomic wings, you're doing hear me, you're doing all sorts of you doing the cuddling business. What has been hard about being an entrepreneur? It's lonely. You are by definition. So there's a few things, right? So one is you really know where the bodies are buried. So you have to, you have to be you have to be the cheerleader for your business, get people on board, but you really know like, oh my God, the website's in really bad shape and my assistant <laughs> just quit and I don't know how I'm gonna do this, right? So you have to almost speak out of both sides of your mouth, right? By definition, when you're creating a business, whatever business it is, you're selling something that doesn't really exist yet, right? And especially if you're going to something that you're basically creating a market, which I find really interesting. I seem to be drawn to that. Like all of the business that I've started or created, you know, were early adopters to sort of markets. I saw a need. Um, so it's lonely because just because you see need, other people don't, right? Um, it's, you know, you just, you have to worry about everything. You're worrying about the money, you're worrying about the product, you're worrying about everything. And sometimes you can't pay yourself and sometimes you max out your credit cards. And so financially it's all over the place. It is an emotional roller coaster. So you can have a morning where you have a meeting with a potential client and you're on, you're so happy, right? It's like, um, everything's amazing. And then you have a call with your developer who, you know, the code broke and the app's going to be down for four hours. You just go through all of these incredible highs and lows and my business now which has has outside investors comes with a whole different set of of challenges i mean when i had my own business i could feel bad about myself but i'm not presenting to the board every three months right where their money is on the line and you know and so it's a very it's very different so don't start a business and run a business unless you have an understanding that uh you're going to be on a roller coaster and you're going to work really, really hard. You know, when I had Atomic Wings and I had cashiers that would complain that the customers are pains and this and that, and they're so difficult. I'm like, you're at a bar at two in the morning. Who do you think your customer is going to be? <laughs> so I think you need to have that understanding that it's going to be Good difficult point. going into it. So everything doesn't blow up and be catastrophized because it's your expectation that right. things are going to be challenging. Good point. Now, now, what what has been easy? Has there anything been easy? No, nothing is really easy, <laughs> but it's incredibly gratifying. So, as the lows are low, like I'll get an, I'll read a review uh, from a a client from a here. You know, I feel so heard now. That person really understood me. It was it's so nice to get things off my chest. I was able to resolve what I was going through. So you get a lot of positive affirmation. So with Atomic Wings, knowing that I was there supporting people financially and letting them support themselves financially is hugely gratifying. Being able to employ people and have them make a living because of your hard work is incredibly gratifying. With Cuddless, you know, having someone who has a disability have that experience and share that they can like 
really for the first time in 10 years, like feel their nervous system relax into their body. It's incredibly gratifying. So you have really gratifying moments and, and you latch onto that, you know? And, and so it's, I don't think anything's easy necessarily. You have easier days than others, but the gratification is incredibly, um, you know, it's like a sports high, right? If you've ever been an athlete, you know, right. it's not easy. It's never easy. You work really, really, really hard and you get these moments of, ecstasy and elation where it's all worth it yeah now you you've, you've mentioned a lot of great words you, you've talked about your passion right you talked about gratification but what motivates you what continue what what makes you get up every morning and keep going yeah so i don't know if your listeners you've ever heard of the Ma maslow's hierarchy of need yep it's i have pyramid right yeah. and the lower part of the pyramid is you know food shelter right yep. then after it you have you have community and then you have family and then you have you know basic uh all of your needs met right so you're financially able you have a sense of community you have some kind of family or or, or love around you you're eating when you want etc but the top of the pyramid is called self-actualization right and so hopefully i'm at the point where like i've met the first four parts of the pyramid but what do I, and ultimately, I think for most people, it's what can I contribute? How can I be of my highest and best value? And so for me, my highest and best value seems to be starting businesses. And now that I've achieved success with the business, that wasn't a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not, it wasn't a social enterprise. It was selling chicken wings, right? right. Now I want to start a business that has, that has a social mission. And for me, the added fun is I've never done a venture backed business. So hear me to have that experience of bringing in investors, have it like, you know, rocket ship and sort of being in that, learning that whole world of like Silicon Valley and, and you know, and raising money and series A and series B and what all of that means has been a tremendously fascinating experience for me. So I feel like a kid learning and then having a board of people that are there to support you and that you have to be accountable for. So all of this for me is, you know, in my mid fifties is really new. And I think it's important for me, I'm learning a lot. And it's funny because I have um, someone who's a, a Columbia, Columbia University grad student is my intern for the summer. And he's actually working with me. And I read an article the other day in the Wall Street Journal and it was like, older people have it all wrong, right? They think the, the younger workers need to learn from them. The reality is because technology has changed and everything has changed so much, you have this opportunity to learn a whole new way of thinking and doing things. So I'm having this experience now in my mid fifties, working with this, you know, um, his name is Ben, who's 24, who is teaching me so much, right? Where, yeah, so I don't know, I think being, I, you know, like Brene Brown says, you know, curiosity is our superpower, right? Yeah. You know, so I think staying curious, staying vulnerable, wanting to learn, but for me, like actualizing, if I feel, I feel in my career right now, I'm doing something very important. And I feel like if I can do something very important and have a successful exit with like a, you know, a real exit, that'll just be cherry on the cake and, uh, and it's fun right now. So I think you have to have a level of fun, even with all the hard work, et cetera. So. I like it. Now what, you know, obviously you got to have fun, but sometimes there's not fun. What, what, are the, what keeps you up at night as a, as a business owner? Everything. I mean, what keeps <laughs> me up now at night primarily is technology because I'm not a technologist and so much, of okay. what a, you know, we are not a technology company in the sense that, you know, but we, we, we use technology to create these connections. So that keeps me up at night, you know, thinking about how to, you know, make sure that we have the, 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 you know, the development, the tech team is, is doing everything they need to be doing. I, I don't, I'm not, the sales aspect doesn't keep me up as much. Um, yeah. It's just, you go through your checklist of everything and you, you look through, okay, who are, who, you know, who are the people in the company? What are they doing? Where are they at? And just sort of like, it, you just keep your eyes open and wide. And, but so for me, I guess my biggest not sleeping thing would be technology, but really what you do is you have your checklist and you really look and you see, you know, what's going on, where can I be of service? 
where am I going to just be a pain in the ass and get in people's way? I can't tell how many times, you know, I just reach out to employees and start asking them things, asking them to do something. And then a day later, my chief operating officer calls me and says, can you stop bugging people? You know, so <laughs> part of my challenge right now is like, what does a CEO of a venture backed business do versus someone that's used to doing everything? Right, right. Now, this next question is kind of a, a two part question. You know, how, how do you continue to push your brands forward? So hear me and cuddling business, right? You have multi-business going at one time. So how do you kind of market and brand and kind of continue to push it forward? And then where do you see both those companies in the next five years? So Cuddlist, I had to make a decision and know that I'm putting so much energy into hear me that I brought in someone who's the head of growth and a partner. So I recognize my limitations and I recognize that I cannot put the energy and time into it. So I need to then cut my shares in half, cut my salary, in it, whatever it was to bring someone in. And this person, her name is Keely Shoup, is a you know, TikTok genius. She's like, one of the leading voices in professional cuddling and she's rocket shipping this company. She's taking the places that I didn't have the capacity to do. Um, so I think part of being a leader is recognizing what you're good at, what you're not good at it and making sure that you're, you compensate for that. So that's sort of cuddlist. Uh, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. And then where, so cuddlist marketing and branding, how do you, how do you continue to market and brand both of them? And then where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, so cuddless, so cuddless, I basically turned the reins over, right. Yep. And I'm now shepherding out and caretaking in a new, a new, you know, I'm, I'm extricating myself out so I can really focus on my new project. Uh, in terms of marketing and branding, uh, for hear me, uh, it's really fascinating, right? So we have our free app, which anyone can get connected, et cetera, in real time. Well, how do you make money, right? It's like I have a, I've had a, a, a not-for-profit by sort of reality, even without wanting to have a not-for-profit, right? But I wanted to see if this problem could be solved. So we have an enterprise side where we sell into enterprises and we have certified peer specialists. We have listeners that are there specifically uh, that have a deep understanding and we have, you know, other bells and whistles for them. For every, uh, member they bring on, we have a give back program where we donate that to a particular organization. So that could be part of branding. I mean, we're relatively new in this, but you look at Tom's, you look at Bomba Socks, the mission of giving back, Ben and Jerry's, right? So that's going to be a big part of our marketing campaign. Uh, and our branding is about, uh, you know, you, you talk, we listen, you know, you be yourself, we listen. And I think that message is really important. And I think it resonates with people. So I think that's very helpful. But yeah, we have a PR firm that we just hired, which got us on the show. We have a marketing agency that we're working with. We have a head of communication, which is coming up, you know, we, we did a rebrand and we have a social media. And so it's a lot of work to be completely honest. But I think if you have a good product, uh, it resonates you know, it, it also attracts. So it's attraction and promotion, right? It's inbound and outbound. You know, you've been an entrepreneur for, for years, you know, you know, over 25 years, I think it was something like that. What advice would you give aspiring entrepreneurs? Something, something that maybe you wish you would have known coming into the so business? There's two things. One is, you know, my fifth grade teacher, I guess I was inquisitive. He used to say ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> right. So a part of not knowing, so young entrepreneurs have that advantage of not Very knowing true. what they yeah. don't know. So you just bulldoze through it and you figure it out. So I wouldn't want to take away that wide eyed, just go for it because uh, you can do that. Right. Um, so I think if you really want to do something, here's my advice. If you have, if, if something is, if you're really passionate about something, Great. If you're passionate about that thing, three months, six months, a year later, and you feel like, so for me, it was like, if I can visualize the outcome, I can make it happen. So have a plan. It doesn't, you don't have to know how you're going to get there. But if you have an end goal, like I wanted to bring authentic Buffalo chicken wings to New York City. It wasn't about how many restaurants we have, how many we're selling. That was my goal. So as I go, how do I do that? Well, A, I use the best wings like they use in Buffalo. 
hey, you know, Dom from the Anchor Bar, who's your wing supplier, right? What hot sauce do you use? Let me go train in your kitchen. So it's like really have a deep understanding of your product and your why behind it. So I guess that's it, have a why. And if you don't have a why, wait a bit. The why may come or, or it doesn't, but don't try to force the why because it's too important. Great, great point. Now for the listeners at home, how can they, how can they find you? How can they connect with you, learn more about you? Where can they get uh, Hear Me or is it out yet? Or where, where can they get Yeah, so hearme.app, just go to our website or go to the Apple or Android store. Uh, if you just Google Adam Lippin, L-I-P-P-I-N, a lot of stuff will come up or Adam at hearme.app. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, hearme.app is the website. If you're interested in Cuddlist, go to cuddlist.com. And Atomic Wings, Zach, you're doing a killer job. Just go to atomicwings.com. <laughs> love it. Love it. Adam, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Listeners at home, I really do hope you took the time to listen because there are a lot of great nuggets in this episode. So Adam, thank you again so much. I'm excited for what your guys going on, uh, really just connecting communities together, uh, really doing a lot of great work from the uh, mental health uh, area too. So I'm really, really excited for you guys and hear me. I hope you guys continue to uh, get going. For those folks that listen at home, please visit me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. You can also visit at theshadesofe.com and please sign up for the weekly newsletter. Thank you and have a great day. Thank night. you.